I have a theory on why Western elites are panicking. Of course, we've been hearing about BYD for months now. Let's say a couple of months, we've been hearing about issues of BYD, you know, starting a plant in Mexico as a way of getting into the North American market. We've been hearing about Ursula von der Leyen wanting to put tariffs on Chinese automobiles that enter the European market on BYD, build your dreams. And hello and welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And wait till you hear this number. Wait till you hear this number. Now, this is from a website. I think it's like an electric car website called electrek.co. E-L-E-C-T-R-E-K dot C-O. And they have a story that came out yesterday. And the headline says, BYD is launching its next-gen Blade EV battery soon with more range and even lower cost. And if you scroll down the article, BYD's cheapest EV, the new Seagull, starts at $9,700. And it's already creating a stir among legacy automakers. Ford CEO Jim Farley called the low-cost EV, quote, pretty damn good, end quote, as he warned rivals. I have another article here from Fortune, but I want to just peruse this article a little bit more because $9,700, I did a search following this shocking number and I put the cheapest Tesla, at least in Europe, where I am based here in Germany, is 42,000 euros. And here, you know, even if we did a one-to-one you know, and euros are actually more than dollars last I checked. So if this is true, and there's no reason to believe it's not, so this new car called the Seagull, BYD's cheapest, it starts at $9,700 and it's an EV. I thought to myself, maybe I need to build my own dreams. Maybe I should get a car because I'm sure as heck not going to spend 40,000 euros on a car. Like, I don't need a car that badly, but for 9700 US dollars, that starts to be something you actually contemplate. And you mean it's electric too? So, pretty interesting, isn't it? I mean, a shocking number. Uh, this came out yesterday, this article by Peter Johnson of Electrek. Excellent article. There's a little bit more that I want to share here too, because of course, we are focused on the beginning of the supply chain. The mining of the minerals. And as we've pointed out, you know, for years now, China owns most of the processing. As we're going to talk to Eric de Saulnier of Nouveau Monde Graphite, they own 99% of synthetic graphite, 60% of natural graphite processing, rare earths, and on and on you can go. Look at nickel through Indonesia, right? Where oh, BYD is opening a factory, as we pointed out last show, right beside the nickel production in Indonesia. So the Western politicians are panicking. Like They don't know what to do. Like, you know, they sure as heck can't do free trade without, as I think Elon Musk is going to say here in the next article, without demolishing all of the auto manufacturers. Incredibly. Like, I mean, $9,700. Now get this, and this is something else I've been highlighting here which is, again, if you own the beginning of the supply chain, you get the best price. What would you do? If you own the battery manufacturer, what would you do? You'd sell it to yourself at cost, and you'd sell it to everybody else at a 30% to 100% markup, right? Basically just enough to make them uncompetitive with you, and you're still making money, and you're profitable. So going back to the beginning of this article, BYD to launch new Blade EV battery in 2024. FinDreams, BYD's battery unit, launched the first-generation Blade battery in 2020, revolutionizing the industry. BYD's Blade batteries power Tesla, Ford, Kia, Hyundai, Toyota, and other popular electric vehicles from major automakers. The batteries are a major reason behind BYD's success. The batteries are installed in most BYD models, such as the low-cost Seagull, Dolphin Electric Hatch, and Addo 3 SUV. By using lithium iron phosphate as the cathode material, BYD can make the batteries much cheaper. Not only that, but they can also offer competitive power density compared to NCM batteries. 
And finally, with a blade-like design, the battery is built for maximum safety while offering, quote, ultra-long range and ultra-long lifespan, end quote. The longer, flatter design saves space and weight for better efficiency. So it sounds like BYD has the battery that you want to have. And that description I just gave you, that was their last battery. And now let's hear about the new battery. BYD is set to change the game again with its next generation Blade EV battery. BYD CEO Wang Chuan Fu said the new battery will be even smaller and lighter with the same endurance during a recent financial meeting, according to a report by Fast Technology. BYD's leader added that it will also reduce power consumption per 100 kilometers, which will likely promote more range and performance. Now, finally, just from this excellent article out of electric.co, here is the top comment. Just to put the icing on the cake here. We just found out there's a new battery coming that's even better. That is the icing. Here's the cherry. Top comment by Chad Shepard. Liked by eight people. I really wish BYD would make a push to the U.S., even with the current political challenges. I've seen BYD in Asia and Europe. Absolutely love it. I like it better than my Model Y. I would even consider paying for the import tax penalty. And the Model Y is 42,000 euros. Now, this person is not specifying which BYD they're referring to. But nevertheless, so here is my theory. This is why Janet Yellen is going to China, among other issues, I'm sure. But surely this is a major issue, and it is a major headline that we have coming up here on CNBC. But before we go to that, here is just one more article. This is Fortune.com. China's EV competition is so fierce that Volkswagen, quote, cannot keep up, end quote, and should avoid, quote, utopian expectations, end quote, says its CEO. So the Volkswagen CEO is declaring defeat. China's EV competition is so fierce that Volkswagen cannot keep up, according to its CEO. This is the state of things here. And so just a couple of highlights I want to make in this article. First of all, interestingly, BYD is backed by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, by the way. And it also beat Tesla for the first time in global sales of electric vehicles in the fourth quarter of last year, although Elon Musk's carmaker reclaimed the crown in the first three months of this year. The intense competition in China's EV space is having ripple effects both within and outside the country. Last month, Bloomberg reported that Tesla planned to reduce production at its Shanghai plant, with the carmaker facing even stiffer competition from Chinese rivals offering more affordable EVs with all manners of features. And then scrolling down a bit, here's a quote from Elon Musk from earlier this year in this Fortune article, quote, if there are no trade barriers established, they will pretty much demolish most other car companies in the world. They're extremely good. And here's Michael Dunn, CEO of Asia-focused car consultancy Dunn Insights, who told the FT in January, quote, No one can match BYD on price, period. Boardrooms in America, Europe, Korea, and Japan are in a state of shock. It must be that below $10,000 sticker price. Again, I think to myself, Maybe I should get a car. I am not spending 40,000 euros on a car in a million years. You know, everybody can do what they want out there. I am not spending that kind of money on a car. $10,000 is reasonable to me. That makes sense. Now, just a final point here, continuing with Fortune. Interestingly, Australia, which has no legacy automakers to protect, is putting up no roadblocks to Chinese EV makers, which are quickly expanding there. And we have seen a warm-up in relations between Australia and China. And one wonders, is it because they let BYD in? And of course, they have nothing to lose. If anything, they have a lot to gain. They can get a really good car, supposedly, for under 10000 US dollars, if this report from Electric is accurate. And here's the Honda president, Toshihiro Mibe, who told the FT, quote, The rise of emerging players is becoming faster and stronger. Companies that cannot respond to the changes will be wiped out. Similarly, just to finish the article here, Ford said in February it's open to cooperating with rivals to lower EV production costs, with GM signaling a similar willingness. Both cited the rising threat from China. And we reported on that story about a month ago. As for Volkswagen, it said it might collaborate on mass market EVs with French rival Renault, 
also with Chinese up-and-comers in mind. As for competing on EVs within China, said VW Chief Bloom, his carmaker, quote, shouldn't have utopian expectations. So whatever happens, the Chinese market, which is what, like a seventh of the world? There's not going to be any barriers there. So pretty interesting as commodity prices rise, just as Western automobile manufacturers are facing this brutal competition. Their input costs are rising, as we're seeing with copper, major breakout, gold, above $2,350, which is a whole other story that we're going to get into in the news section, but we're seeing a major breakout here in metals. Now, just another couple of stories here on this subject. Tesla scraps low-cost car plans amid fierce Chinese EV competition. Now, scrolling down the article a bit, Tesla's cheapest current model, the Model 3 sedan, retails for about $39,000 U.S. dollars in the United States. Of course, in Germany here, they add the VST, so 20%, so we're about the same amount, right? I was saying 42,000 euros, let's say $39,000. The now defunct entry-level vehicle, sometimes described as the Model 2, was expected to start at about $25,000. So Tesla was working on an entry-level vehicle that was supposed to retail $25,000. Tesla did not respond to requests for comment. After the story was published, Musk posted on his social media site X that, quote, Reuters is lying again, end quote. But interestingly, the plan now for Tesla is to shift to robo-taxis. Think if you're Elon Musk and you are just not able to compete on input costs, and there's nothing you can do because you can't go to the person that makes the batteries to say, hey, can we work out a deal? where BYD, as the maker of the battery, always will have an advantage over you. So what do you do? Maybe you pivot to robo-taxis, which is what Kathy Wood has been saying about Tesla for the last, you know, three or four years. The AI and this idea of self-driving cars is the real winning ticket for Tesla. So maybe you pivot to that. Maybe you even buy BYD cars for your robo-taxis. And just finally here, two sources said they learned of Tesla's decision to scrap the Model 2 in a meeting attended by scores of employees, with one of them saying the gathering happened in late February. Quote, Elon's directive is to go all in on robo-taxi, end quote, that person said. The third source confirmed the cancellation and said new plans call for robo-taxis to be produced, but in much lower volumes than had been projected for the Model 2. So with that, Here's Janet Yellen, headline on CNBC. Yellen says she won't rule out possible tariffs on China's green exports. And we've been seeing this strategy bubble up over the last few weeks here. Andrew Forrest was saying it. If we can't compete, say, with nickel, and we have to shut down all our nickel mines, and we actually have a story with Andrew Forrest here from the FT, then maybe we should have a green price for nickel and really trying to almost bully the LME into adopting it, the LME not wanting to adopt it, and Andrew Forrest responding, maybe we should just find other places then to sell our metal. So here's Janet Yellen now. This is Karen Gilchrist with CNBC. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on Monday said she would not rule out any measures, including potential tariffs on China's green energy exports. Quote, I wouldn't rule out anything out at this point, we need to keep everything on the table, end quote, she said in an interview with CNBC's Sarah Eisen. The U.S. has been increasingly voicing concerns about an oversupply of subsidized clean energy products to international markets, which it says hurts domestic competitiveness. And probably the clean energy products she's talking about are the solar panels, which we haven't even discussed here. One imagines the exact same thing is probably happening with solar panels. And here's another quote just finally from Janet Yellen. Quote, we just want to make sure that we're not driven out of business and that our firms and workers have opportunities in these industries, which will be important ones in our future. And finally, one more quote from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, quote, it's fine for China's firms to export in this industry to develop it, referring to solar panels, but some of the techniques that they use, subsidizing their firms very heavily and then supporting them even when they're losing money, this is something that's unacceptable from the U.S. point of view, and many of our allies feel the same way. Right, the state-controlled capitalism is pretty hard to compete with. Now, finally here, this is also interesting. China's Minister of Commerce, Wang Wentao, on Monday slammed accusations of oversupply by the U.S. and Europe and instead said the rise of the country's EV industry was a result of, quote, constant innovations, end quote, 
according to China's Ministry of Commerce. Chinese-built EVs are currently subject to sizable 27.5% tariffs in the U.S., a policy imposed by former President Donald Trump over concerns around unfair trade practices by Beijing. I guess maybe you'll have to pay $12,500 for your car with the tariffs included. So, you just see the scale here. Now, just a couple of headlines. France pushes EU measures to rebalance trade with China. This is a headline out of Bloomberg. This is by William Horbin, and it says, France will lobby the European Union for measures to rebalance trade with China based on environmental criteria, as it sees an economic threat from a glut of Chinese products flooding the bloc's market. So this is a multi-pronged assault from the Chinese, and shifting over to the FT, we have a story that came out two days ago on Sunday, mining billionaire Forrest urges China to demand greener nickel. Australian magnet points finger at, quote, irresponsible, end quote, standards for processing in Indonesia. In an interview with the Financial Times, Forrest, the chair and largest shareholder of Fortescue Metals Group, said electric vehicle manufacturers should be wary of Indonesian nickel, which he said was being extracted at immense cost to the environment. So we can already see the playbook that's going to come out of the West, can't we? Sorry, you can't have your vehicles in here because they are unenvironmental. I think that's what we're going to see. Quote, China will need to enforce its own environmental standards on its global supply chains, end quote, Forrest said during a visit to Bao, southern China. Now, right now, there's still a bit of a sticky inflation problem in the West, right? So what does that mean if all of a sudden in China, you're getting cars for $9,000, you don't have an inflation problem, and in the West you do, and you're also paying 40,000 euros for your cheapest Tesla? Quite a stark situation here. Forrest continues, quote, China will need to enforce its own environmental standards on its global supply chain. End quote. Every buyer of nickel, quote, needs to be really careful if they're buying from that Indonesian source, end quote. So the kind of response we're getting here, to me, suggests this is a survival kind of response. Like, I think what we're hearing from Volkswagen... What we're hearing from Honda, you know, CEOs of major automobile manufacturers are not known for exaggeration. Maybe an exception with Elon Musk, who says they will be demolished. But it sounds pretty accurate if you look at the numbers that we seem to be seeing here. And finally from Forrest, kind of a threatening quote, if the LME did not differentiate between, quote, dirty nickel and clean, just because it financially suits them, then in the end, there will be consumer backlash. Interestingly, Forrest also said oversupply in China's renewable industry was, quote, fabulous news for the rest of the world, end quote. So I guess as long as it's not in the industry that Forrest is investing in, oversupply is great. It's exporting deflation. Isn't that what we want right now? Don't we have a bit of an inflation problem? And finally, just a couple of more related headlines. EU sees hope for U.S. minerals deal from new forced labor law. So again, we're going to see ESG, I think, become a bigger and bigger issue as far as importing and exporting. And finally, just a story on deep sea mining. I was mentioning last week how it was kind of difficult to get a press release or some kind of news on how the meeting in Kingston, Jamaica wrapped up of the International Seabed Authority, which was discussing, very importantly, deep sea mining and the mining code. So I found a very good article from Manga Bay Com. I'm not sure where this website is out of. It is in English, and it quotes Olav Mikkelbus, the Norwegian diplomat and elected ISA Council president for 2024. Quote, we have indeed made very good progress, referring to the ISA's meeting, but it's a very open and transparent discussion, and there are very many states and NGOs that have opinions on a number of the paragraphs. That means it takes time. That's just the nature of the game. However, Matt Janney, a co-founder of the DSCC which is the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, who attended the council meeting as an observer, said he doesn't believe the negotiations are progressing as well as others have stated. Quote, there are many areas where these negotiations have not progressed, and some cases have become even more complicated as a result of the discussions over the last two weeks, Janney said during an online DSCC press briefing on March 28th. Now, to me, this rings true, because we never really got much of a statement after the meeting. And one would think they would all wrap everything up and say, this is what we've decided. It sounds like the reason they didn't is because they didn't come together and figure it out. Here's another quote from Janny. 
In many respects, the negotiations are even farther apart than they were at the beginning of the week or at the end of the last negotiating session in November of last year. And they've got a long way to go before they can agree to everything that needs to be agreed and before they can then begin taking on applications for mining. Anyone who says otherwise, in our view, does not accurately characterize the status of these negotiations as they are at the moment. So that is probably why, again, we don't have any clear information. Also, Nature. If you heard last episode, remember the very famous scientific journal Nature was basically singing a similar tune. And final headline, just to wrap it all up, this is from Jackson Chen at the Northern Miner. Tesla can't dodge activist shareholder proposal on deep sea mining, according to the SEC. So just a couple of lines here. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has cleared the way for an activist proposal on seafloor mining to be considered at Tesla's upcoming annual general meeting. The SEC rejected a request from Tesla to omit the shareholder proposal on sourcing material from deep sea mining from its AGM. So all to say, this is the situation, and I'm not convinced on this deep sea mining. The story I heard before, as I mentioned in previous episodes of, oh, we're just picking this stuff up off the ground. The more I look at it, again, the more this thing looks like an industrial strength vacuum cleaner that just, you know, vacuums the bottom of the sea for these polymetallic nodules. I have reached out to Gerard Barron. I will reach out again to see if he can counter this perception. Because, again, this is not picking up rocks at the beach, as was the general impression that I had. But you see here, there's China without need for environmental concerns in the way that the West is. And here's Tesla. Not only are they faced with a $9,700 BYD Seagull entry-level vehicle, not only that, but also if you plan on getting any metal from the ocean, we're not cool with that either if that's lowering your costs. So you see the business constraints here. And again, we see the ESG and the environment coming center stage into this minerals discussion, which again is at the beginning of the supply chain. So coming up this episode, we have a wonderful interview with Eric de Saulnier, president, founder, and CEO of Nouveau Monde Graphite. And what Eric does is give us the latest information on how we're doing sourcing graphite and processing graphite in North America. A fascinating discussion and update as we continue to learn more about what's happening with graphite. And also, we have a wonderful CEO spotlight with Step Gold Chief Financial Officer Jeremy South, who describes the company's two gold projects in Mongolia, as well as other projects in Peru, what it's like to work in Mongolia and what they are up to. So a wonderful show ahead of us in a very exciting, dynamic minerals discussion. So with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on X at Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts. And wherever podcasts are available, including SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And with that, let's turn to Jeremy South, Chief Financial Officer of Step Gold for this week's CEO Spotlight. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome to this week's CEO Spotlight, Jeremy South, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Step Gold. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adrian. Nice to be here. Well, it's excellent to have you. You are working in such an interesting part of the world, Mongolia, where I guess the name Step Gold comes from. For those that aren't familiar, with Step Gold, could you give us a little bit of background on the company and what you guys are up to? Sure, thanks, Adrian. And again, great to be here and excited to talk a bit about our company. Step Gold was established back in 2016 to be a Mongolia-focused precious metals company. We went public on the TSX in 2018 with our marquee asset, the ATO Gold uh, Silver Project uh, in Eastern Mongolia, and then followed up with an exploration project in Southwest Mongolia. So we've been at this really for almost eight years now. We started production in our marquee project in 2020, right actually as the pandemic was beginning. And we've been in production in our phase one project since then. Now, Step Gold did an interesting phase as it transitions into a multi-asset producer. We're acquiring uh, the Boro Gold project just north of the the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. And that's a 70,000 ounce a year producer. And that will transform us into a multi-asset producer with lots of exploration upside at all three projects and, and a plan to to build on that over the coming years. 
Okay, excellent. So Step Gold already produces then, you're saying you began around the pandemic. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. We started production in 2020. We've produced about 110,000 ounces so far since inception. And that that phase one project, as it sort of winds down, we're in the construction phase of our phase two project, which is the expansion. That was always the larger piece of that that project. And that'll be 100,000 ounces a year producer for 12 years, starting in 2026. So we're a producer, we, we generate cash flow, we pay taxes and royalties. And we're looking to expand that production profile, as I mentioned, with that acquisition. Indeed. So you've acquired a second project just recently, and this is in Mongolia as well. So how is working in Mongolia? What can you say about it? I, I assume uh, if you've acquired a second asset, it must be uh, a place you enjoy working. Yeah, I, I think the team's got a lot of experience there. I've been working in Mongolia for 14 years off and on now. Our founding chairman and our current chairman and CEO have both significant experience. So we you know, we had a lot to bring. You know, we came to this in 2016 as the Mongolian government you know, was changing and I think a, a big push to, to recognize the importance of the mining industry in Mongolia. Mongolia is a, is a mining country. It's a uh, 90% of its exports are mining exports. Uh, 25% of its GDP relates to mining. And it's significantly, and it's the most significant taxpayer in, in the country. So small country, it's about three and a bit million people. Uh, over half is in one city, the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. It's also the second largest country in Asia. It's also the most sparsely populated country in the world. So, you know, it's got great geology. It sits between China and Russia. You know, it's reasonably flat. So, you know, the opportunity to, to mine is, is made easier. It's obviously the home of the Ayu Tolgoi project, now owned by Rio Tinto, which will soon be the third or fourth largest copper project in the world. It's a major exporter of iron ore and coal into China, and it really hosts pretty much every mineral you can think of. So, you know, it's a developing country, though, and that's sort of where the opportunity is. You can mine in Mongolia in a slightly more effective way than other countries. It's developing, it relies on mining. So, there's an inherent built-in parachute for mining, but now you also got this talent pool that's really managed to de- develop over the years, over the years of um, Otolgoy in particular, but, you know, so it's a growing industry as well. And you were saying the, you started with the ATO mine and there's been a second acquisition. So just in terms of the profile of these projects, in a sense, is ATO then the flagship or is the newer project, is that going to be even bigger? It sounds like it's a fairly large thing that's already producing. Help kind of put some flesh on the bone here as to what is happening in terms of these projects. And are they pure gold projects? Yeah, I mean, they're primarily gold projects. So the way to think about us, and the acquisition hasn't closed yet, it's it's been announced Um further announcements actually this week probably but the two projects ato is kind of our landmark project that's a 1.3 million ounce of recovered ounces that's in phase one moving to phase two that'll be producing 100,000 ounces in 2026 uh, the project we're acquiring is borrow gold is in its sort of later stages still has about eight years to go did about 70,000 ounces last year something similar to that so you think of our profile we're about 21,000 ounces this year in ATO, so combined about 90,000 on a pro forma basis, 90,000 next year roughly, and then you know about 150,000 ounces in, in 26, 27. So you know, really sort of a, making a step change here. You know, 90 to 150,000 ounces at, at current gold prices is a significant revenue, you know, north of 200 million dollars of revenue per annum at that 90,000 level, and you know, closer to 300, 350 in, in 2026 of revenue. So, you know, that's the profile. And then I think ATO is a, is a 12 year plus mine life and, and borrow is about another eight years. So that's sort of the way to look at it. And we look to add to that. Uh, we have other projects potentially to bring on stream. So the aim is to be here in a couple of years, a, a company with a portfolio of five to seven of projects, all at various stages of development, but always with, I think, a couple of projects in production. Okay, excellent. And that's where I wanted to go with this. So what is the roadmap? Is there anything we missed as far as where it's all going? It's a Mongolia-focused multi-asset mining company with exploration, development, and production stage assets. You know, a, a good solid pipeline, a balanced pipeline of cash flow and development and exploration upside. And one thing we haven't talked about is we do currently own a small project in Peru, which was acquired about a year or so ago. 
that's being sold as part of this uh, transaction with Borrow Gold. So, you know, really sort of getting back to our netting, if you will, investors want a fully fledged exposure to the Mongolian mining industry as a way of, you know, really, you know, playing that um, that trend. I mean, Mongolia is well located. It can source equipment. It exports commodities to China. So it has a, has a ready market. So it really is about building on its strengths. And I think investors are starting to warm to that idea. And in terms of the costs, do you guys have a number, say, on the all-in sustaining costs? You know, how are you feeling just in general? It's remarkable. You know, I was interviewing Jeffrey Christian last week, and, you know, he was saying how the costs follow the gold price, because as gold goes higher, then people will mine in a more expensive way because it's more worth it. So how are your costs doing on these projects? Mongolia has always been bottom quartile in cost. Labor is cheaper and we can source equipment significantly more cheaply than anyone who has to sort of, like if you're if you're located in the Yukon or something, you've got to bring things in from probably Europe and it's costly to get it there. And, you know, we put things on trucks from the factory in China. So you know, that's a huge advantage from a cost perspective. Labor is you know, significantly lower in Mongolia than elsewhere. So we have some built-in cost advantages. I think we'll always be bottom quartile. We're sort of 900 to 1,000 on a blended basis probably this year. So that's, you know, average goal, average AISC is around 1,400 these days, I think. So, you know, we're definitely bottom quartile, possibly even bottom decile. And and I think that's one of the critical attributes of, of mining in Mongolia. You can mine at the lower end of the cost curve. Um, that's not to say inflation is not there. Obviously, if you're buying commoditized items like steel and so on, you, you're going to pay more for them. But that location is uh, is an important competitive advantage. And just as we wrap up here then, Jeremy, what is your message for investors? I think the step gold, it's all about cash flow. You know, we're moving from a, a small producer with a development pipeline to being a, a mid-tier producer with a great pipeline. So it's about generating cash flow. Uh, it's about paying dividends in the future. It's about execution on our development stage projects, including the uh, obviously the major one. So cash flow, execution, and developing a project pipeline. Those are the three things I think to, to take away here, Adrian. Excellent. Jeremy South, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Step Gold. Thank you for joining us on this week's CEO Spotlight. And thank you once again to Step Gold for sponsoring this week's episode of the Northern Miner Podcast. And turning to the website, gold price touches $2,350 on firm central bank demand. This is by a staff writer at mining.com. And this was written yesterday. Now we are at 2,378. We're almost at $2,400. And if you look at the chart, there's been a climb only since February 13th at $2,007. February 13th, here we are at April 9th, less than two months later, and we're verging on 20% here. 2,000 to almost 2,400. What is that, like 17%? So a relentless move in gold. So let's see what mining.com is saying. Gold kept its momentum on Monday, hitting $2,350 an ounce for the first time before pairing gains as investors shifted to a key U.S. inflation reading later this week. And there was a slight pause yesterday in gold's rally, and it came as traders assess where U.S. policymakers now stand on the timing of their pivot to lower borrowing costs ahead of the March inflation data Wednesday. The Federal Reserve expects to cut this year, but says it needs to see more evidence that inflation is easing first. The precious metal remains supported well above $2,300 after notching a series of fresh all-time highs in recent weeks. Yet the move has left some onlookers puzzled amid a lack of any obvious trigger for the sudden rally that began in mid-February. Since then, gold has gone up by more than 18% with at least some of the gains fueled by optimism that the Fed was getting closer to cutting rates. For the year, bullion is up by double digits at 13%, despite headwinds from strong U.S. economic data. Now, I asked Jeffrey Christian two weeks ago, and if you didn't hear that show, I highly recommend it. I thought Jeffrey Christian gave the best answer as for the cause, which was this idea that investors had done very well in the stock market, and they were divesting from their paper gains. Like it's basically portfolio management is all it is. Again, stocks had done fabulously. Let's diversify. Is NVIDIA, is it going to double from here? So to me, that actually made 
a lot of sense. Now, there's also this other idea that I wish I had asked Jeff more about, which is this idea that the Shanghai Gold Exchange has had a higher premium. And I have read that perhaps the higher premium in China is helping drive gold prices higher. Now, continuing the article here. Central bank demand has evidently been a supportive factor, with the People's Bank of China reporting an addition for a 17th straight month in March. And we have a quote from Han Tan, chief market analyst at Xfinity Group, who told Reuters, quote, Gold bulls may have taken their latest cues from the People's Bank of China, which extended its buying spree of the precious metal for a 17th straight month in March. So people are trying to figure it out. I like the simplicity of Jeffrey Christian's answer diversifying out of paper gains, and also concerns about perhaps a heavier than expected recession, the so-called hard landing also, and why not buy gold if it hasn't moved? You could argue it's a rotation of sorts. Also, just a headline here, China's central bank adds more gold to its reserves in March. That's Reuters via mining.com. And another headline, China's latest investment frenzy sparks wild swings in gold ETF. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. And also another headline here. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. The gold market hunts for answers behind bullion sudden surge. So the explanations we're getting from Bloomberg via mining.com. Seasoned executives and analysts offer very different answers to who or what has driven gold to its unprecedented heights. Is it a central bank worried about the dollar's role? as an economic weapon. Funds betting that the Federal Reserve's pivot to lower interest rates is imminent. An army of algorithmic traders drawn to gold simply because it's going up? Stubborn inflation and worries about a hard landing? Weakening currencies? Upcoming elections? All of the above? The mystery has sent industry insiders poking through the plumbing of a massive gold trade that stretches across futures and exchange-traded funds from New York to Shanghai to a huge over-the-counter hub in London and world-spanning web of dealers selling bars, coins, and jewelry to everyone. It's an opaque and complex world that's historically been hard to crack open. So why are they buying further down the article? That's the big question. The glaring hole in the narrative of the past five weeks is that while the Fed is expected to start cutting rates this year, which should benefit gold, many investors have actually become less convinced about the timing than they were a few months ago. Exactly. I think this whole idea that it's rate cuts, well, if that's the case, it should have moved two or three months ago, as this article is pointing out. One possibility is that some gold investors are instead zeroing in on that prospect of a hard landing in the U.S. economy based on the recent data and rushing to buy bullion for its role as a haven. I think, again, the less dramatic way of putting it is, to Jeffrey Christian's point, it's a diversification out of paper assets. You've done really well in your tech stocks. You might as well preserve those gains, right? The idea could also provide an explanation for another curious movement in the gold market in recent weeks, the relationship between a closely watched gold price spread and U.S. Fed interest rates. The percentage yield between London's spot and a three months forward, which tends to track interest rates because of the cost of storing, financing, and insuring gold, has made a rare dip below Fed rates in recent weeks as spot prices soared. Historically, that only happens on a sustained basis when rates are either low or about to move sharply lower. The inversion of the spread may signal that nervous investors are clamoring to get hold of spot gold now as protection against potential turmoil. Quote, this rally is defying a lot of normal thinking, especially when it comes to still elevated rates. End quote, said Ole Hansen, head of commodity strategy at Saxo Bank. Well-known commentator, quote, I think the narrative is changing towards sticky inflation and perhaps a hard landing, spiced with a lot of geopolitical uncertainty and deglobalization driving central bank demand. End quote. Again, I think this is about preserving wealth. I don't see it as mysterious as everybody else, but I mean, that's just one opinion. And perhaps maybe it's not even that different from what they're saying. Like, it's just came time when everything else being up, metals look cheap. It was that simple. I would argue. Continuing on, Zimbabwe launches gold backed currency to replace dollar. This is by Cecilia Jamasby at mining.com. Zimbabwe said on Friday that it will launch a new currency backed by the country's gold reserves, the latest move by President Emerson Mnangagwa's government to stabilize its rapidly devaluing currency. Zim Gold, to be introduced on April 8th, which was yesterday, will also be backed by foreign currencies and other precious minerals. The new central bank governor, John Mushaya Van Hu, told local press, adding that it would circulate alongside a basket of other currencies. I mean, it always comes down to 
Is it a gold backed or something that can be exchanged for gold? That is the key here. It sounds like it is gold backed, but not necessarily, but not necessarily exchangeable. The ZIG currency will be introduced at a rate of 13.56 per dollar, along with a new interest rate of 20%, a monumental cut from the previous 130% rate, which stood as the highest central bank rate globally. Banks are expected to convert their existing Zimbabwean dollar balances into the ZIG. So pretty interesting story. I mean, it's going to be interesting to watch this experiment. A lot of people discuss this in the gold community of having a gold-backed currency. I mean, here seems to be a little bit of a laboratory for that financial experiment in Zimbabwe. Continuing on, Mali expects 14% drop in industrial gold production. Just a headline here, Reuters via mining.com. And I don't have an update, and there is still no update on Barrick and Mali and the Wagner Group. So perhaps that story is blowing over, but I'm still watching very closely to see if we're going to get an update there. Also in Mali, industrial gold output is expected to drop by about 14% this year to 53.7 metric tons, Mines Ministry data showed on Monday. The West African country, one of the continent's top gold producers, is home to industrial mines operated by international companies including Barrick Gold, B2 Gold, Resolute Mining, and Hummingbird Resources. Its industrial gold production stood at 66.5 metric tons last year, almost unchanged from 66.2 tons in 2022. The Mines Ministry did not provide reasons for this year's lower forecast. The data showed Barrick Gold is the country's biggest gold producer, with an output representing 36.8% of this year's expected production. It is followed by B2 Gold at 26% and Resolute Mining at 11.5%. Last November, Mali signed an agreement with Russia to build a 200-ton-per-year gold refinery in the capital, Bamako. It also adopted a new mining code that will allow the military-led government to increase its ownership of mining projects to 35% from 20%. And that is your article. So interesting developments out of Mali. Continuing on, copper hits fresh 14-month high on supply fears and China optimism. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Copper jumped to its highest intraday price since January 2023 as the bellwether industrial metal faces rising tighter supply and hopes for a recovery in Chinese demand. Prices climbed as much as 1.7% to $9,484.50 a ton on Monday before pairing some of the gains. The metal has rallied about 15% in the last two months. And we have a quote here from Ewa Manthi, a commodity strategist at ING Growup. Quote, last year, rising demand for renewables and EVs in China already offset the slump from the more traditional sectors like the property market. We expect the shift in demand drivers to continue this year. So interestingly, the rise in demand for renewables, maybe solar panels, although that's mostly silver, and EVs, you know, BYD in China already offset the slump from more traditional sectors like the property market. So Maybe it's all the cars that BYD is selling. And just a few more headlines. Kamoa Kakula's first quarter copper output drops by 6.5%. You can read that story on mining.com. Also, Cadelco says copper output recovering. And they were struggling all of the last, I would say, two years with lower copper outputs. So Cadelco, with their new CEO, is starting to make progress on recovering its production. And of course, Cadelco is the world's biggest copper miner. Again, you can read that on mining.com. But you see the challenges as we see another headline here. This is Bloomberg News on mining.com. Chile port workers stage protests threatening commodity exports. So it continues to be difficult with protests in Latin America. And here's an update with First Quantum. First Quantum warns of dangers of long-term concentrate storage at Cobre, Panama. And this is a staff writer at the Northern Miner. First Quantum Minerals subsidiary in Panama is warning of the dangers posed by the long-term storage of copper concentrate at the disputed Cobre Panama mine. According to the miner, regular monitoring has detected an increase in the chemical reactions that generate dangerous gases and a rise in the material's temperatures, which poses environmental risks and threatens the health and safety of those doing care and maintenance work at the operation. So interesting story there. Also, another story out of Peru... Peruvian gold mine's power infrastructure attacked for the 14th time in two years. This is Valentina Ruiz Leotode at mining.com. Briefly, the Poderosa gold mine in northwestern Peru experienced yet another attack by illegal miners who this time around used dynamite to take down two high-voltage towers that supply energy to the operation. 
located in the province of Pataz. So these aren't environmentalists. These are illegal miners who are trying to take out the competition. Very interesting story. And finally, leading up to our feature content here, gallium prices more than doubled since China export curbs. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Prices for gallium are close to their highest since 2011, as China's export restrictions crimp global supply and hurt buyers of the metal used in a swath of high-tech applications. International prices for gallium are now more than double where they were when Beijing's new export curbs were announced, according to Fast Markets data. That means higher costs for making equipment where gallium is a crucial material from semiconductors and radar devices to solar panels and smartphone screens. And one wonders if that includes automobiles as well. Those are your news stories. Now, let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, let's turn to the bond market. For context, the U.S. 10-year bond is yielding 4.4%. That is 0.05% higher than last week and continuing a climb in yields that we have seen for the last three weeks and averaging things out really from 3.88 about three months ago. So now at 4.4% on the U.S. 10-year, of course, Jeffrey Christian saying real interest rates at 3% or above is when gold starts to lose its luster as an investment. Until then, it remains attractive. The UK 10-year gilt is yielding 4.05%. That is 0.02% lower than last week. And the Italy 10-year gilt is yielding 3.75%. And that is 0.03% lower. So UK and Italy 10-year bonds edge lower while the U.S. 10-year bond edges higher. Turning to precious metals, gold is trading at $2,382.30 per ounce. That is $105 higher than last week. Silver is at $28.14 per ounce. That is $2.44 higher than last week. So big move in silver. We finally got the breakout above $26, and now we're at $28. Confirmed breakout there in silver, platinum is trading at $990.50 per ounce. That is $38 higher than last week. And palladium is trading at $1,064.50 per ounce. That is $62 higher than last week. Turning to industrial metals, copper is at $4.29 per pound. That is $0.24 cents higher than last week. Seems like a breakout there. Iron ore is unchanged at $102.68 per metric ton, about 50 cents higher than last week. Aluminum is at $1.12 per pound. That is six cents higher than last week. Lead is also higher at 95 cents per pound. That is three cents higher than last week. Nickel is trading at $8 even per pound. That is 48 cents higher than last week. Tin is also higher at $13.06 per pound. That is 61 cents higher than last week. Cobalt is unchanged at $12.95 per pound. Lithium is higher at $15.14 per kilogram. That is 27 cents higher than last week. Uranium is slightly lower at $87 even per pound. That is $1.50 lower than last week. And zinc is at $1.21 per pound. That is 10 cents higher than last week. And a price we haven't seen in zinc for quite some time. So the metals seem to be moving in unison here with gold leading the charge. The dollar is slightly lower on the week, so perhaps that is the reason. Other than that, it seems like the animal spirits have finally arrived for the metals. And those are your metal prices. Coming up, I'm very pleased to welcome Eric Desaulnier, president, founder, and CEO of Nouveau Monde Graphite to the show to discuss all things graphite and how we are doing in reshoring the supply chain in regard to graphite and, of course, its importance for batteries. It's a fascinating interview with a lot of information on the subtleties of graphite as we continue to learn 
more of that market here, this time with Eric Desaulnier. It is a wonderful discussion. I hope you enjoy it, and I will see you on the other side. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome, for the first time to the Northern Miner podcast, Eric Desaulnier, President, Founder, and CEO of Nouveau Monde Graphite. Eric, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me, Adrienne, and the great French skills. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, (laughs) I did take French immersion for 12 years, and let me tell you, it comes in handy. I have to say, I'm very glad I took French. You know, there's not many things I actually remember from elementary school, but taking a second language seems like one of the most important things you can do. Yeah, and if you come at our mind site where it's 100% French, maybe 120% French, you'll see it's pretty handy when you're lost in the middle of the wood near near saint michel des saint <laughs> Yes, yes, I could imagine, I could imagine. No, I am very uh, grateful for that. That was in actually Saskatoon, Saskatchewan that I learned that. So you are, again, president founder and CEO of Nouveau Monde Graphite. So tell us, how did you get started in graphite? You've been with the company or you started the company about 12 or 13 years ago. In a sense, I was going to say before it was cool, but it was actually kind of cool about 10 or 12 years ago, right? Where graphite was a bit of a thing and then it kind of passed a little bit and now it's back in fashion. Tell us a little bit about the company and how you started out, why you started out in graphite. Yeah, no, it's great. Somebody who remembered that graphite was super cool. And when we started a company and, you know, I was at the time a geophysicist. I was working for most of the explorer in graphite. They were hiring us to do airborne surveys near the only producing graphite mine in North America that was at the time owned by Emiris, like this hill mine, maybe 20 minutes airtime from my home. So I was doing a lot of geophysical work at the time. So that's where I decided to start a company, Nouveau Monde Graphite. So exploring the new world, looking for this new commodity that apparently we will need a lot in the future. So that was really the basics at the beginning. So we were using our uh, geophysical skill set and the system that we had with uh, a partner. And we were surveying like huge areas that was never explored before until we discovered a few years after 2015 to 2014, really, we discovered the Matawini mine that we have now, the Tony block name under the uh, geologist that was still with us, who was the one after 20 ground truthing of uh, airborne anomaly that finally found this uh, big Eureka uh, Eureka moment, finding the big deposit that we have now that is close to production. So really, that was the foundation. And we were fortunate enough at the time to have all families and friends, but also uh, local like technical institutions like Caisse de Depot, like FTQ, SCDEX, and a few very important institutions in the early days of NMG who believed in our exploration strategy. And they supported us and we listed in 15 January 2013 that we listed the company. And that's after investing $200 million, that's where we are now. You know, I want to return to this whole idea of how Quebec really creates a, you might say, a welcoming environment, a supportive environment for miners. So I want to return to that. But before we do discuss that, I want to ask you, in a sense, how did the narrative change like is it basically the same narrative we have today with graphite i'm trying to remember in my head like tesla i think was around was it a battery issue why was graphite a big deal when you started and has it changed the narrative at all yeah i would say the uh the pricing spike that we had in the early 2010 11 and 12 i would say like the price of graphite was triple at the time was really the first time that the Western world declared the uh, flake concentrate a critical minerals. And it was a very small market at the time. And there was a spike because China was missing graphite for a short period of time. So it created like over 100, 120 different graphite projects at a time. If you remember, it was pretty crazy. So that's when we listed a company. And at the time, there was only the future projection of Tesla and Panasonic were in construction on the first big giga factory in Nevada that is now producing. It was the only one that was pretty big. It it was a a battery plant, if you remember, that was bigger than the whole market 
together. So 40 gigawatt hour was bigger than the, the whole market and for battery in the world. So it was starting. So the demand at the time was not justifying a large mine. So in fact, we were starting a much smaller project at the time. And our closest competitor, Mason Graphite, at the time, were starting a mine at 50,000 ton per annum. That was the design of the mine they were proposing because the market wasn't that big at the time. It was not at all like in the closest dream, like the craziest dream, I would say. It wasn't that big that the people were planning in 2012 as it is today. Today, it's clearly a huge market that is in construction in the US, in Europe, and even bigger in China. And now, like those big mines and those big projects are totally justified because the whole market is switching to EV. But it wasn't like that in 2012. We needed a bit of faith at the time. Yeah. Interesting. So it was more of a projection back then, whereas now there's more of a, you might say, a concrete reality to, you know, justify, you might say, building a mine. So you mentioned China, which is a very interesting topic. I mean, from what I understand, I've had people discuss graphite on the program before. And if memory serves, it's something like 99% of synthetic graphite is processed in China. And I was just looking at a headline, China is strangling the exports of graphite. I think it came out two weeks ago, this story. So could you just clarify what the situation is with graphite right now in terms of supply and just graphite moving around and how important is the synthetic versus the natural? Is there, is there a way of illuminating all that? Yeah, for sure. So the whole discussion around synthetic versus natural, you know, it depends on the cell maker. You need to know your cell maker, your customers. They all have different blends. It's always a blend between natural and synthetic, and they both provide different things in the battery. And the customer, they never want to change this blend. They never want to change the recipe. So you need to know the recipe and just talk to the right customers who are guiding you in the correct way for a long time. And you're right, China is the dominant player. So it's two thirds of the graphite concentrate is manufactured in China, but 100% of the spherical graphite that goes into battery like the spherical, natural spherical graphite that goes into battery is made in China somehow. So all the cell factories outside China are relying on China, which is not sustainable. Synthetic graphite also, it's a big, big chunk in China. So it's the most controlled of all battery material by the Chinese economy. It's a huge concern for all cell makers, especially the one in US when, you know, you're kind of in the middle of a geopolitical intensifying discussion, I would classify it this way. So it's very important for all cell maker to have an alternative. So we don't want to be replacing altogether China. We just want to be this safe alternative, carbon neutral, locally sourced, made the right way, high quality, and just making a meaningful scale for the customer in North America to have an alternative in their supply chain to what they procure today in China since a long time. So that's exactly what we're doing. And not to get too technical, but this is very interesting what you're mentioning here with the spherical graphite. So this is the graphite that goes into batteries, you're saying. And from what I gather of what you're saying, it sounds like that can be natural or synthetic. Could you just clarify, like, so there's spherical, which is for batteries. What's the other kind of graphite? Yeah, so without going too technical, as you say, you need to have a spherical shape. If it's natural or synthetic, you need to have a spherical shape. So for natural graphite, as you can imagine, Mother Nature cooked this carbon for millions of years at 3000 degrees C. So it's a very high crystallinity, very high quality graphite source right in the ground that the synthetic graphite you cannot really do in a few days slash weeks of cooking the, at 3000 degrees C a needle coke. You, you will never get the same level of crystallinity. So capacity seems to be very important for natural graphite slightly better but at the end of the day they are both graphite so they're very close i mean it's not big difference but slight difference better capacity on natural but it's swelling a little more so it create a bit of a swelling in the battery so depending on the form factor it have more or less importance so every customer they crack their own recipe they know exactly what they want and it's our job to do the product, the specification they give us and work with customers who are willing to go with this specification for a decade. 
So the two agreements we have with Panasonic and with GM, Panasonic is seven years post start of operation. So it's 10 years commitment on the specification. Same with GM, which is six years post start of operation. So you need customer like that, that understand what they want and they want it for a long time and they commit to it. At the end of the day, we're not the one deciding exactly the specs and why they need it. We're the miner. We need long-term commitment. We're building a generational project. So we need to have solid partners who have the same long-term vision. And then what we propose is a business strategy. It's an alternative to China, as I've said, that fits this need. But we're still a startup. So we have made a 200 million of investments so far amongst many different things, bringing demonstration plant alive to understand all the process steps. So we do the mining, we do the shaping, the purification, the coating. We have our own lab to do all the testing. We have now over 120 employees, 40 engineers, 10 PhDs to understand all the different steps and be able to somehow compete with those very established uh, Chinese suppliers to, to be this alternative. But it's a lot of work. It's way beyond a typical explorer. Absolutely. And that's exactly where I wanted to go next was this whole processing strategy. And just to finish up on Spherical then, you're mentioning 3000 degrees. It sounds like spherical graphite, as far as I understand the term, this is something that's created during the processing of the graphite. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So initially it's a flake. So the lithium ion need to go within the flake. So it intercalate within the flake. So if, if you want to have the most edges possible, the best way is to do a spherical shape. So when you do a spherical shape, you expose the most edges possible so the lithium ion can go in in many different orientation. So it improves the power rate, it improves everything in the battery. So you need to have this spherical shape out of a flake. So you can imagine you need some mechanical processing to do that. And then you need to purify that spherical shape to get very close to 100% purity, very stringent specs on purification. And then you put a small carbon coating around this shape to hold it together and having the minimum surface area possible to minimize the interface with the electrolyte in the battery. So all those steps, it's not rocket science. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. The, the product is exactly, it's pretty much optimized by the Chinese supplier. You just need to do the same thing with better business strategy. And that's what we do. Now, in terms of the strategy then for processing it sounds like you are building the infrastructure to process it yourselves rather than sending it to china is that correct absolutely if you want to be competitive it's not having the mine only it's not having the transformation plant only it's having the full vertical it's very important to have your own source of flake yourself if it was that easy a lot of processor from asia would come here and do it but they need to have the mine as well. So having the mine is important, but also having the ability to transform the product all the way to the anode material is the way to go. And that's what we have done. So we have a phase one that is operating now. We have a nameplate capacity of about 2,000 tons per atom. And we have mine about 40,000 tons of ore to produce 2,000 tons of concentrate in, uh, since 2018. And we're using that inventory of concentrate to test and provide samples to all those customers and testing every day now, uh, optimizing this process to transform it and finish anode material. But we've built a full vertical and now we have announced for the phase two, 85% is offtaked with both uh, GM and Panasonic. So uh, pretty much sold out on the phase two. And that's why we've acquired our competitor asset, Mason Graphite, for the phase three to start working on the phase three now that the market shares are to be taken, considering our knowledge of the process and our knowledge how to develop a mine in North America. And we have the geology in Canada and Quebec. We're quite lucky. We have both the geology and the great infrastructure to transform it with cheap hydro. It's very energy intensive and the right mindset from customer who want the product now. So, so we have the right set up to be competitive in this process with our friends in China. Okay, excellent. And just on the processing, what is the timeline? Like, have you already started processing? Has it been figured out, so to speak, the you know business model, I suppose you'd say, or even just the physics of this process? 
or is this like a 2027 type situation? When does this happen? By the phase one, if you come in our plant, most of the 120 employee works in our plants and we have made pretty much at scale all the process steps. So if you come and visit or like the customer did before doing those offtake agreement, they came and visit and we can deliver ton scale samples. So we have like very large demonstration plant both at the mine side, two hours north of Montreal and St. Michel des Saints, where we have most of our processes. And the only one that is not in St. Michel des Saints is the purification that is in Bicancourt in the phase one in our chlorine supplier facility, all in, in Bicancourt. That's where we do the purification. But those are massive demonstration plant, like almost commercial scale that we will duplicate in many, many modules going to the commercial project. So we are doing it since few years already. Since 2018, we're floating graphite from the rock. And since I would say 2021, we are producing the full anode material uh, vertical in the phase one. And then the last step is easier said than done is to finance the 1.5 billion to build both the mine at the commercial scale to start producing 100,000 ton per annum of concentrate in 2027. And concurrently doing the 42,000 ton of annual material to deliver on those offtake that we announced in 2027 in Bicancourt. So the mine site started construction maybe a year or two ago, but pending project financing, we're kind of doing a slow pace of construction now on the mine site. And last week, we started the first early works, I would say, the preparation of the ground, removing trees and preparing the, the soil. So we're doing that now in Bacon Core. So quite exciting to see uh, some machinery on sites and be ready, hopefully in the next, I would say, next few quarters, be in a position to raise the money and be in the full-blown construction to deliver in 2027, the phase two to GM and Panasonic. Pretty impressive. So when you say 100,000 tons in 2027, how big of a deal is this like is this you know the proverbial drop in the bucket like you're saying we're not trying to replace china like how much of an impact is this going to have how much is this going to alleviate the situation you know of maybe there not being enough graphite from outside of china how much is this going to help <laughs> stay with me you see 42000 ton per annum that's what we'll produce in bikin court that's the Largest project in North America and the most advanced will be in production in 2027, 42,000 ton. It's good enough for 500,000 EV, give or take, 500,000 EV. Just last year in the U.S., we sold 1.4 million EV in the U.S. We sell 15 million cars altogether in North America, but, you know, 1.4 million EV. So only last year, like, and the growth is not happening yet because all those battery plants in the U.S. are not built yet. So it's 140,000 ton of graphite was needed last year to be delivered in those cars that are sold in the U.S. market. So three times what we're planning to build that will be in production in a few years uh, from now, you know, in 2027. So by 2027 or by 2030, we will require 1.5 million ton of this product at least to be able to do uh, enough car, you know? So 1.5 million ton, if you add up all the battery plants that are in construction from GM, from Panasonic, from even Tesla themselves, from Ford, from all the others, Toyota that are building plants. So it's a lot of product, a lot of project like NMG need to happen, like at least 10, 20 NMGs, which is a lot of work for the small amount of people we are, you know? So it's a, the real revolution is not really the EV transition is the EV transition that we want to do ourselves, onshoring of all those processes. It's, hmm. it's, it's amazing the amount of work we need to do collectively to deliver all the materials needed. And as I've said, graphite specifically, it's affordable. It's uh, available in China today. But China decided December 1st, as you pointed out at the beginning of the podcast, December 1st, China said that in the future, you cannot export graphite outside of China, unless you have an exemption. So you need to apply for exemption to be able to export graphite outside of China when you're a supplier in China. And it's a customer per customer basis, the analysis. So it's the first time China is really doing this. And at the same time, December 1st, the US said, 
they make the definition of foreign entity of concern clear in the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, telling the Chinese government that we don't want your graphite in any form. <laughs> Even if it's coming straight from China or if it's a Chinese company outside China or if it's a license of the technology from China, you would be excluded from any uh, incentive package from the IRA. So the December 1st day, like it's, it's very important for graphite. That's why all the sale maker now, they need to have at least one alternative. It's not that price sensitive graphite in the whole scheme of thing for them. It's 8% of the battery cost, give or take. But if this 8% isn't there, if graphite isn't there, it's major catastrophe for the billions of dollars invested in the battery factory and the cattle material and all the other things. If you don't have the graphite at the end of the day, because China is playing hardball, uh, it will be difficult for our EV transition. So <laughs> that's why we're building a project five times the size right after, and we're trying to go as fast as possible with the right customer that have the same mindset and see the same needs. But the challenge is to deliver all the capital needed and in the time frame that we need to be a bigger drop in the ocean of needs by 2027 to 2030. But there's room in the market for growth, for sure. Indeed, as you say, after December 1st, it sounds like a whole new world in graphite, Eric. <laughs> so as we start to wrap up, I want to return to Quebec. But just as a final point on what you said, I actually think that's fairly significant. You know, if it was like 140,000 tons needed and maybe in a couple of years you'll have 42,000, that's not bad from one project. Like it's still, I would call that a significant chunk and maybe you can grow with that as well, right? So I say not bad, Eric, at all. So and it will so, be about, I would say, 5 to 10% of the demand by the time we are in production it will be 5 to 10% of the demand in North, North America. So we need others to join the, the parade because we cannot do uh, all of it alone. Yeah. yeah, I think it's so important too, as you say, like having this vertical, because I think China has this inherent advantage in a sense that they're the first customer, so they can get their graphite maybe at cost or even below cost if the government is helping out and they can undercut everybody with their electric vehicles. So you're just powerless unless you really have your own supply, it seems. So it's important work there. Now, I, I want to return to Quebec and the discovery to a certain degree, just as we're wrapping up, I don't want to lose this. So just tell us a little bit, like you mentioned, interestingly, it sounds like you acquired a property and it wasn't until two or three years later that you had the Eureka moment and then also you had support from like the Caisse de Depot and maybe other organizations in Quebec. Can you just kind of tell us within a Quebec context how they helped you reach a kind of success that perhaps you would have not achieved otherwise? Yes, what is uh, interesting in Quebec, there's institutions that can support projects at every stage of the uh, evolution in a mining project. So very early days, the most uh, important institution to support us, even when we had only an idea and no assets, because when we explored, we had no assets. We did something very different than the others. We explored in areas where we had no claims. So we were exploring in the new world. So we needed institutions to understand exactly what we were doing. I had faith that we would keep everything confidential. We would do some work and then we claim after. So we created this process, you know, that was not, it's not a typical way to, to explore. But initially, it was Sodemex, which is an affiliated company of Caisse de Depot that does not exist anymore, that was supporting us. They were at 10% of the company. CDEX, who still exists today, who's very, uh, very important player in the market for all junior explorers in Quebec. And FTQ, a big uh, union, maybe a 10, 11 billion under management that supports early stage exploration. And then the families and friends. But when you have half or two thirds of your financing made by institution that has geologists on the payroll who understands exactly what you're explaining them and what is your, your idea. So it's very important to have those players who support early stage the idea. And the regime, it was pretty good for us to just do this exploration and claim and then do some work. And then all the, the very important social acceptability work we did. The Quebec government were always behind us until today, where IQ, Investissement Quebec, is one of our large shareholders. 
and they are today the right institution for us to support the project and they will most likely be there at project financing with very significant equity and debt contribution so we have all different institutions that support us along the way depending where you are and also on the permitting side because at the end of the day permitting is very important when the project advances and you have the Quebec government as an investor it's not only a passive investor they also make sure they coordinate all the work internally at the government so you access your hydroelectricity you access all the different permits you need so you, if you need to contact a specific uh, ministry for it, you cannot imagine the amount of permits we need to start a mining project so i think this quarterback internally at the government is pretty handy as well so this is very important you do hear good things about quebec so just looking then at the exploration sector in canada having gone through this process i mean you mentioned long term money right and there seems to be this situation where there's not long term money in exploration right and so the sector often is starved for money i don't know if that's changing right now some people like i was talking to rick rule last week he thinks they have too much money for example you talk to an explorer they say like we can't do anything here so what is your sense of the situation and what needs to happen to encourage exploration say in canada for example hmm. i mean we are very fortunate to have this low through tax regime it's very very uh important for our access to capital you know it's not financing gna but at least you can finance most of your crazy exploration ideas with that regime and we should be happy about that it's a very good start and we should make sure every year we recognize the importance of that regime for the exploration most of the money spent in the ground most likely comes from either receiving a tax credit or flowing that tax credit to investors so that's quite important you know i'm making specific representation that i would love the same kind of uh, support for building big capex especially critical minerals we have now an investment tax credit about 30% of the eligible capex will be coming back to the company after you spent it so it's very similar to an exploration tax credit so now i'm trying to make this itc regime also that you can flow it to investor so we could access that money right away and start construction and allowing you know, all the taxpayers in Canada to own the resource when we built it so especially the critical minerals that are eligible for the ITC credit so that's something that the flow through regime that is available for exploration should also be available when you need at the end to build those projects because in critical minerals we have quite a few graphite deposit quite a few lithium deposit it's not about exploration that much it's about building those assets and supporting those companies into the development and the construction of those assets. Yes, we can explore more, but the exploration is more for difficult things to discover like gold, silver or all the base metals. But for graphite lithium, there's quite a few good companies out there already. We just need to make sure we deliver some in the market at some points. So that's where I would tend to suggest that the government also look at this how to build more project, not only exploring more exploration is super important but in some commodity you need to be nimble and you realize what's needed it's not only exploring for more in critical minerals you need to build something at some point yeah. okay excellent and just as a final question is there anything we haven't discussed that you think we should discuss here or that hasn't been mentioned so far no i think it will be a very exciting journey for our generation in the next uh, decade or two it's very intriguing to see where the ev revolution will end how it will be uh, built and we're very fortunate to be in the middle of this action eric desonnier president founder and ceo of nouveau monde graphite thank you for joining us and sharing your insights on this week's northern miner podcast thank you very much adrian Thank you once again to Eric de Saulnier for a fascinating conversation on what is actually happening in graphite and the supply chain and the challenges involved 
in reshoring. Also, a big thank you to Step Goal for sponsoring this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to help out the podcast, please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Share it with your friends. And until next week, take care.